On this edition of Primetime Politics, the Prime Minister defends his Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations amid accusations that she is a racist. We'll hear from an Indigenous group calling for Carolyn Bennett's resignation. And as Parliament wraps up for the summer and a possible election call, our journalists will be in to reflect on the government's track record, the issues to expect in an upcoming election, and the challenges facing the opposition parties. But we start with those calls for Minister Carolyn Bennett to resign. On Thursday, she apologized after sending a text message to former Cabinet colleague and Indigenous Independent MP Jody Wilson-Raybould. Wilson-Raybould had been urging the Prime Minister not to call an election and to focus on delivering transformative Indigenous rights legislation. Bennett responded to that tweet with one word, pension implying Wilson Rabel didn't want an election because it hap if it happened before October, she wouldn't qualify for a parliamentary pension. Wilson Rabel called the comment sexist and racist. The Union of BC Indian Chiefs is calling for Minister Bennett to resign. We'll hear from them in a moment. But on Friday, the Prime Minister defended his minister. What Minister Bennett did was wrong, and it was hurtful. There's no question about it. And whatever reasons of uh, interpersonal uh, issues, there's no excuse. And that's why it was right that she apologized. But I know Carolyn's heart. I know how hard she has worked for decades on this issue. And I know how much more there is for us all to do. And I know that she understands how much more work she's going to have to do in the coming days, weeks and months. Joining me now is Chief Judy Wilson. She is Chief of the Nisconlith First Nation. She's Secretary Treasurer of the Union of BC Indian Chiefs. Uh, Chief Wilson, first of all, thanks for taking the time. Uh, thank you. Um, I want to um, get your reaction. The Prime Minister today said that he is not going to fire Minister Bennett. He's not going to ask for her resignation. He says she has apologized and that she deeply regrets her comments. How do you respond to what you heard today? It's the continued genocide that the government is uh, perpetuating on our people. They're ignoring, uh, denying, and no accountability. So those actions to Trudeau are, is the continuation of that. And, you know, Minister Bennett has a very important, uh, important file. She has a very important role in Canada being, uh, you know, the head of CERNA, uh, Crown Relations. And Crown Relations need to have that truth and they need to have the utmost uh, accountability to upholding the laws of the land and also to our Indigenous people, especially at this time, many of our nations are in mourning in regards to the residential children that are being found in unmarked uh, graves and mass grave sites and burial sites across Canada. This couldn't happen at a most atrocious time that she would make those remarks to one of our most upstanding uh, women leaders in the country that she could be racist and uh, could be arrogant and could be say things that are so insensitive to our indigenous people even if Trudeau can't doesn't have the the uh, can be able to say oh we're gonna fire you know our one of our head uh, you know ministers our people could say we fire her we reject her for how she's conducting herself and how she's acting and that she doesn't have any accountability i don't know how people are going to be able to sit across the table from her knowing that this is how she really thinks and this this is how she really conducts herself. And how do all the staff under her uh, conduct themselves? Okay, Are they can going I, um, to be treating... Okay. Can I ask you that? Because, I mean, you have been in your position, and you have been, you've attended negotiations, you've attended summits, you've attended activities. I'm, I remember the one here in Ottawa on, the, on the, I think it was Canada, B.C. family uh, policy. You have sat, uh, you have met with Minister Bennett in the past? Uh, yes, I've had direct meetings with Right. Minister Bennett uh, on, on a continued basis. So is, it, and, is your position uh, you know, is your position that you can't work with her anymore then? Well, I, I can't look at her and see that she has the real interest and the real uh, heart for our people after what she's done. 
she's exposed herself in what she really thinks and how she treats her people, treating one of our most esteemed uh, women leaders this way. And so, you know, it's exposed. It's just like how we're looking at all the other truths that are coming out. These truths are coming out now of what she has at what she has in her mind and what she has in how she conducts herself. There's no way that should have been ever dealt with that way, especially with the, uh, with the, um, you know, with Jody relaying, you know, what she really felt and what she okay. wanted to see for our people. And then it was. Okay. So I guess, I guess, I guess my question just is then, I mean, going forward, does this mean that on behalf of the, uh, the union of BC chiefs and your organization and the many chiefs and first nations it represents that you, you will not be dealing with the minister anymore in, in any of these portfolios? I mean, there's a lot of ongoing things going on. The union, the BC and Chiefs, we sent a letter out calling for her resignation. We'll continue to do that. We'll provide updates to our chiefs. At the end of the month, we have a focus meeting on the uh, Council Indian Residential School. And I believe that many, many chiefs have the same uh, feelings. Like, you know, how could one of our top ministers in Canada be so insensitive? and have no accountability at the same time. Uh, Trudeau, I believe, is doing the not doing the people justice in this way. He's not, because it wasn't just the comments to to uh, Jody Raybould Wilson. It was about the whole situation that's happening to the residential school, uh, to the survivors, to those children that are still in unmarked burial grounds that need to come home the mass graves and the burial sites. It's about how our Indigenous people are continued to be treated in this genocide, colonialistic pattern that's continuing in his government. Okay, can I ask you about that then, to widen the issue? Because we, they're, they're with these discoveries, and we won't even call them discoveries, but with the more, more and more uncovering of these burial sites and more and more evidence and the, and the shock and the anger and the reaction to all of this, the, um, with regards to residential schools, uh, do you feel there is a groundswell, and do you feel that you'll have any action on getting investigations and possibly even criminal charges laid with regards to the events and with regards to what happened in the residential schools because the residential school settlement as you're aware over all those years never included criminal investigations never included criminal responsibility it included reparations being made and apologies being made do you think we are now turning a corner and do you think you'll see any action from the government on that the children in the unmarked you know mass graves and in the uh, burial sites you know, the truth is coming out now, and, you know, it can't be stopped. So, Chief Wilson, I guess the last question, though, is do you think we are at a turning point, and do you think we will see criminal investigations and possible charges? Without a doubt, there needs to be the criminal investigations. There needs to be the legal framework set up here in Canada, and there also needs to be the United Nations oversight because these are mass graves. These are uh, burial sites that are unmarked, and there needs to be the correct investigation so that there can be accountability. Where in the world would you find mass graves of children in the thousands that go unaccounted for? In Canada, we need to do that. We need the support of the citizens to make sure that this is accountable. And we also need the, the work to set up that legal framework because there is none, even though the Truth and Reconciliation identified at least 4,100 children in the missing children's report. Uh, Canada did nothing about it. We can't let that go and escape us this time We ha with the real evidence and truth being exposed now, if you will, and we need to do justice by those children, and we need to uh, you know, recognize the harm that's done to the, the survivors of those schools and their families. So we can't continue in denial. We need to have accountability by Trudeau, and we need to be able to have a transparency and a proper process in this investigation, and that's what the chiefs are calling for, not just reconciliation, but restitution. Okay, Chief uh, Judy Wilson, thank you very much for speaking with us. Thank you. The House of Commons has adjourned for the summer and it's widely suspected that the Prime Minister may call an election before Parliament returns in September. So what better time to take stock of what has been achieved and what hasn't, the highs and the lows, and the political landscape as federal politicians gear up for a possible election. To do that, I'm joined by three members of the Parliamentary Press Gallery. Christy Kirkup is a parliamentary reporter for the Globe and Mail. Katie O'Malley is a regular contributor to, to iPolitics. And Tonda McCharles is joining us. She's a parliamentary reporter for 
for the Toronto Star. All three of you, thanks for joining us. Thanks hey for having us. Okay, let's start with, I mean, when I first framed this question about uh, the biggest disappointment or the least performing minister, I don't think any of us would have said or would have thought of Carolyn Bennett. And yet today, here we are and we're hearing for calls for her resignation. I want to hear what you make of it and how does it relate to who you think has been the government's least successful minister. Let's start with you, Christy. Yeah, I think that um, I'm actually quite surprised, given the fact that Carolyn Bennett is a veteran politician, the fact that she essentially walked into this controversy and decided uh, that she was going to text Jody Wilson-Raybould. Jody Wilson-Raybould told me yesterday that she actually hasn't heard uh, by text message anyway from Carolyn Bennett since December of 2018. And then she reached out in this way and, and asked uh, again about uh, her, her pension. And of course, Jody Wilson-Raybould uh, immediately said that this was racist and completely unacceptable. So, um, you know, again, Carolyn Bennett is a very experienced minister, uh, has worked very hard on the Indigenous Affairs file. I've covered her on it for several years. And uh, the fact that she walked into this controversy again, I, I thought it was out of character her character for her, mm -hmm. frankly, um, just because she um, has been around a long time. I'm not surprised, though, that the Prime Minister is standing by her, uh, because, again, uh, she has worked uh, very closely with a number of communities on this uh, particular file with respect to Crown Indigenous relations. And at this moment in the country, I don't think uh, the Prime Minister is looking to usher his Indigenous Affairs uh, or uh, Crown Indigenous mm -hmm. Relations Minister aside. So how does that relate, then, to who you would cho choose as being the, the most disappointing? Or or the least performing minister? You know, I think that for me, um, I've covered the sexual misconduct uh, controversy for several months now, and there have been lots of questions from opposition parties, calls for Harjit Sajjan, the defense minister's resignation. And I think, frankly, uh, Harjit Sajjan's performance has been under the microscope now for, again, a number of months, particularly kicked off when uh, the former military watchdog Gary Welburn testified at a parliamentary committee that he, of course, had an a meeting in person where he tried to alert the defense minister to allegations about uh, chief then chief of defense staff Jonathan Vance. Then we learned that the prime minister's office was aware in 2018 because uh, Harjit Sajjan had informed his chief of staff who then informed the prime minister's office and there was some follow up after that and they said they could not find out further information. But the question remains, um, you know, about Harjit Sajjan's political future, I think, okay. um, and, you uh, you know whether whether he will you know be reelected um, in in this forthcoming election. Okay, uh, Katie, who would you who strikes you as being a particularly ineffective or a liability in terms of ministers? Well, despite a, a, a last-ditch effort by Carolyn Bennett to capture that title, I will still have to give it to Canadian Heritage Minister uh, Stephen Guibault, simply because the big file he had in the last sitting, which was the broadcasting overhaul, he managed to mangle in so many different ways. Not only did it turn out to be a far more controversial piece of legislation than I think anyone yeah. expected because of the last-minute change to remove social media, uh, to remove what had been a blanket exception for social media, but he really, when he was criticized, when concerns were raised, he kind of picked a fight over it and then started to, you know, go after people who were criticizing them and really taking the an aggressive approach, which I don't think helped him at all. So it, I found that his inability to sell the bill and his inability to explain why they made that change probably okay. gave the government much more of a headache in the last, you know, two months or so of Parliament than would otherwise have been the case. Okay, Tonda, your nomination for a most problematic or least uh, well-performing minister. Well, look, I, I went with uh, Harjit Sajjan, too. I mean, Harjit Sajjan is the worst performer by a long shot in this government and has consistently been so um, over certainly the course of this mandate. Um, and I would argue, actually, he, there are things that he needs to answer for in the last man, mandate, too. Um, I think that he is the opposition's exhibit number one for failing to uh, handle the sexual assault issue in the military. And I think that, um, you know, frankly, uh, he's, he's, he's sort of, encapsulates everything there is around all those criticisms you hear about this government being better at words not action at um, not being uh, great at actually implementing its promises and it has promised for a long time to deal with that issue and in the six years they've been in power since they had recommendations on exactly how to deal with it they did not okay i want to flip the coin uh, or see the other side of the coin and ask who you think was the government's best performing uh, and most reliable minister, uh, Christine. 
Uh, I chose uh, Christia Freeland, of course, the finance minister and the deputy prime minister, perhaps. Um, you know, that, that's an easy choice. But I think that Christia Freeland is, of course, um, really relied on in the Trudeau cabinet. And the situation that we're seeing right now is not just a public health emergency. It is a financial crisis. And we will be feeling the economic impacts of COVID-19 for many, many years to come. So I think that uh, Trudeau has leaned on uh, Christia Freeland to a great extent um, before the pandemic. And of course, he has leaned on her through throughout this pandemic in the way of, again, government supports and ensuring um, that they have a, a plan in mind with respect to where they want to go on, on the economy. So that's why she's uh, my nomination for this category. Okay, definitely very high profile. Um, Katie, who would you nominate for most effective minister? I would actually go for Public Services Minister Anita Anand, who is a relatively new addition to the Trudeau cabinet. She just joined in, in the last election. She wasn't around before that. And she had what turned out to be an incredibly difficult fall because she was the, sort of the point person in terms of putting all those vaccine contracts together and ensuring that Canada would have the supply. It was sort of fiddly stuff. It wasn't the big picture. You know, if you're the health minister, at least you can go out there and talk about health. If you're other ministers who were involved in sort of that frontline approach had a more... Um, um, a more tangible thing that they could sort of express as what they were doing, whereas she was kind of doing contract negotiations for months. And I think she actually, as it turned out, did a pretty good job in terms of hammering those out. And when she was called upon by the opposition parties to explain, which happened a couple of times during the uh, House of Commons, the committee, the whole uh, sittings that we saw last summer, but also during the last couple of months, she went before various House committees and was questioned over, you know, the fine print of those contracts. And I thought she did a pretty good job of defending herself and of explaining Explaining, uh, how, making the case that the government did uh, perhaps even a better job than you know would have been expected, given that we were starting from a, a position of some weakness, what with not having the domestic manufacturing capacity. So I think that in general, she really seemed to do well on the vaccine procurement. Mm -hmm. And as a sidebar, she was also because of you know the way her department operates, she was also involved in delivering some of those support programs mm -hmm. as well. So I think that you know in general, she really performed. She wasn't a high-profile minister, but I think she performed really well. Yeah. Yeah, definitely in the spotlight and definitely in the thick of it as, as the vaccines took on such an importance. Tonda, who would you nominate for the most effective or the most reliable minister in Look, the front bench? I agree with both my colleagues on Freeland and Anand, both very competent ministers, um, but I went with Carla Qualtro because I find her to be unflappable, clear, an excellent communicator, and she was responsible for a large frontline department delivering the bulk of the pandemic aid to individuals. And I thought that she has performed remarkably during the whole pandemic, um, never a fumble really, and uh, so my vote went to her. Okay, um, I want to uh, look at the larger issues in terms of uh, issues and how they were handled by the government, because of course, as we get to, as we anticipate a possible election call, the issues are going to be crucial. Um, let's look at the worst handled issue. What do you think is the worst handled issue for the government? What did it handle uh, badly? Um, let's start with you, Christy. Yeah, I would say that the sexual misconduct issue has um, definitely dogged the government for a number of months now. And frankly, again, to Tonda's point about the fact that there were recommendations, this is from Marie Deschamps, a former Supreme Court justice who put forward, um, you know, the, the fact that uh, there was a, an issue of sexual misconduct in the military uh, some six years ago now in 2015. And yet this became a huge crisis for the government. There have been a number of survivors coming forward with their stories. We've seen high ranking military leaders, um, you know, facing investigations or even having to leave uh, their positions. And I think as far as the government is concerned, um, you know, they have really not been able to explain why it is that they're now, for example, having another Supreme Court Justice, Louise Arbour, um, trying to, to look at the notion of setting up an independent mechanism for survivors to come forward with allegations of sexual misconduct. Mm -hmm. Again, they have been in government uh, for the last six years, and they did not follow through with that central call from Marie Deschamps, which was to set up an outside mechanism outside the chain of command for sexual misconduct in the military. Okay, Katie, what do you think was badly handled, particularly a difficult portfolio or well, a difficult issue? 
I'm kind of going with a more meta issue. It's handling the House of Commons in general and its legislative agenda. Because this is this was a situation where, on paper, the government did, in fact, have the support from either the Bloc Québécois or the New Democrats to get a fair chunk of its legislation, at least its mission-critical legislation, mm -hmm. through the House of Commons at a decent pace. And yet, at every opportunity, they really seem to squander that. If it, you know, if they weren't sort of uh, allowing these uh, opposition-driven filibusters to continue where they could have stopped them by bringing in time allocation or something like that. They were just making weird calls and weird decisions in terms of house management. And it got to the point where it almost seemed as though they wanted some of these bills to be lost or to be stalled or to be stuck for political reasons. And while that might be, you know, something that you might come up with on the campaign field as a strategy, it certainly isn't something that gives you decent marks for house management. This is, yeah, they're in a minority. Yes, that means there's got to be compromises and they're not going to be able to get everything through. Mm -hmm. But they could have, I think, done a lot better than they did. Okay, Tonda, what's your nomination? Look, I went uh, somewhat along the same lines as Christy, uh, but my my uh, take on it was, uh, put it a bit more broadly speaking, harassment in the workplace, toxic okay. workplaces. This government did, failed to handle the military question, but they also, remember, failed to handle the governor general situation. So lousy on dealing uh, with employees and their concerns. Okay. No, interesting. Interesting. Okay, so let's now see if that translates, because a badly handled, handled issue during the course of Parliament doesn't necessarily translate into the biggest liability on the election campaign. If the Prime Minister declares an election, calls an election this summer for the late summer or early fall, what do you think uh, will be the biggest liability on the election campaign trail for the government? Uh, let's start with you, uh, Tonda. Um, look, I was going to talk about their penchant for complacency in the face of some of these problems we've talked about, or their arrogance in dealing with some of them and the challenges they've gotten from the opposition and their critics. But I think I'd have to land on economic uncertainty because I think that's the one thing they can't control. I think that they've put in place a lot of things, and that would have been my pick for best, you know, all kinds of pandemic aid dollars to help individuals to cushion the economic and the financial blow. But I think that's the one thing they really still can't uh, fully control, that's a mm -hmm. potential liability. Okay, interesting. Um, Katie, what would you say risks being the biggest liability as they're out on the campaign trail if they go out? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sort of go with something that is a perpetual perennial problem for liberal parties in general when they've been in government for a little bit of time, and that's the ethics issue. Uh, there's enough. It becomes a cumulative issue. Yeah, you've got things like the We Charity controversy, which consumes sort of, you know, months and months of time, but then kind of fell out of the headlines. But it added a marker, I think, in the minds of a lot of voters. Then when you have news stories come out that seem to take a similar bet, that's going to kind of, you know, add into that list and add into those considerations. I'm not sure. I mean, given that we are coming out of a pandemic and we'll, which will be very fresh off if there is, in fact, an election this fall, I'm not sure, frankly, if there's going to be much time to talk about or delve into anything but the economic issues and exactly. the question of how the government performed yeah. in the pandemic. But assuming that there is, I think that the way both the allegations that have been lodged against them and in some cases confirmed with findings by the Ethics Commissioner, but also the ham-handed way that the government has handled those allegations in progress when they're mm -hmm. kind of trying to defend themselves and making things worse, that's definitely a weak spot for them. Okay, Christy, your uh, your feelings on what could be a big issue in this election campaign? I absolutely think the issue of residential schools is going to be in sharp focus during the election. And I think there is the possibility that there could be additional burial sites that are uncovered even during the course of yeah. an election campaign. We saw just in the last uh, month or so two um, former uh, residential school sites, um, unmarked uh, graves that have been uh, brought to the country's attention. This is a horrifying story. And frankly, there's a huge accountability piece and that is calls from Indigenous leaders for an independent investigation into what happened at Indian residential schools. Those were church um, uh, you know, run but government funded institutions that forcibly removed Indigenous children from their families, from their cultures. Marie Sinclair, the former TRC uh, chairman, has called for there to be an investigation. The Prime Minister is expressing some openness to that, but what does that look like 
And again, that central piece about accountability, because I do think that while the residential school legacy was documented by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission when it released its report back in 2015, including an emphasis on the existing um, existence of burial sites, now this is something that yeah. um, is permeating uh, the minds of Canadians as we hear about these stories. And frankly, I think this is the tip of the iceberg with the funding that's been allocated uh, by different levels of government. I think you can only anticipate there are going mm -hmm. to be more discoveries. Okay, let's uh, let's wrap on the last topic, and that is I want to ask you for an opposition party. Choose an opposition party who is up against it. In other words, a, a big challenge facing one of the opposition parties. I want to start with you, Tonda. Uh, if you have to choose an opposition party and what its biggest challenge is if the election is called. Yeah, I think uh, I'm going to say the Conservative Party and its biggest challenge is Erin O'Toole's invisibility, near invisibility to Canadians. I feel that since he's been elected leader of the party, he has failed to have a constructive impact on many national issues. I think he, within his own party, faces huge challenges. He hasn't united it yet. His signature uh, carbon pricing policy was seen by his base as a reversal, and it's not guaranteed to win him votes in urban Canada, where he might hope to grow the party. And so overall, you know, I think he's aligned himself with unpopular uh, con Mm -hmm. provincial premiers who've seen their popularity decline and i think he's got a huge hill to climb in this election okay we're going to go to you uh, christy what uh, what party you're looking for and what a party that's really up against a big challenge if the election's called yeah, I'm going to echo a lot of what Tonda said with respect to the Conservatives and essentially the ability for Erin O'Toole to resonate with Canadians because I absolutely agree with Tonda that that um, issue of the fact that he hasn't really resonated is, uh, is a real problem for him personally and for the Conservatives. And of course, in the last election in 2019, under a different leader, um, under Andrew Scheer, the Conservatives had a very uh, disappointing showing. They were hoping um, that they would be able to form government. That didn't happen. And yet, some two years later, with a new leader, uh, the Conservatives are still fighting to try and turn things around and uh, to try and get out of opposition and to be competitive in the way of trying to mm -hmm. form government. And I think, frankly, the Liberals are hoping that Aaron O'Toole continues not to resonate so they can look at forming a majority um, should they head back to the polls, uh, whether it's the summer or, or into the fall. Okay, Katie, uh, last word to you. What are you looking for? Uh, what's inter interesting to you? Well I, well, I agree. I echo what my colleagues say about the Conservative. That's going to be fascinating to watch unfold. But I'd also like to suggest that the party leader who I think right now is under the most direct and critical challenge of actually being removed from that position is, of course, Anime Paul of the Greens. Yeah. And that's why I'm definitely going to be keeping an eye on what goes on both over the summer in terms of this uh, uh, ultimatum she's under from the federal council to uh, basically redeclare her alliance to the caucus and repudiate her former advisor. Does that happen? Does it not? Is there a leadership? review does the green party even if she does uh, keep the job until you know a still theoretical upcoming election this is a real make or break test for the green party i think if she's not able to show you know significant gains which when you have well two seats now i would say unless she's able to come back with maybe mm. five six seven edging in on official party status it's going to be really difficult for her to remain more than a single election i think that in that sense she doesn't she isn't going to get the same grace period mm -hmm. that elizabeth may did who was able to kind of keep being the leader for you know election after election without winning any seats. Okay, well listen, the three of you, absolutely wonderful. I want to wish you a happy and quiet summer and we'll see what happens. So <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for sharing your uh, reflections. Thanks, have Martin. A have a good summer, everybody. Thank you. And that's all the time we have for this edition of Primetime Politics. I'm Martin Stringer from all of us here on CPAC. Thanks for watching and have a great weekend.